Hello, BookTube. I went back to the Brattle Bookshop this morning. That is a used bookstore in the heart of downtown Boston. A great, great shop where the, there's a huge buying table right as you walk in the door. It used to be for years and years and years when you went to the Brattle Bookshop on West Street. The first thing you would see when you walked in the door was a Bernese Mountain Dog as big as a grizzly bear. <laughs> Usually laid out flat on the floor, just enjoying the breeze from the door, but sometimes not. He, alas, is not with us anymore. It's a poorer world without him. So now the first thing you see when you walk in the door is the big buying table. Right there inside the door, there's a huge cinder block buying table where the staff is constantly pricing and sorting and sorting things, and that table is new all the time, and that stuff is going out, either to the shelves in the store or to the, the sale lot next door, which is thousands more books for $1, $3, or $5 and constantly overturned. I always think that the buying table right as you walk in the door is a perfect symbol of what separates the Brattle Bookshop from so many other used bookstores, where you, if you have books to sell, you bring them in one paper bag and bring them to the counter in the back, where the conspicuously overweight proprietor and his conspicuously overweight cat can sniff over them with condescension, while NPR plays in the background. There's nothing like that. <laughs> the, the, the Brattle is a cattle yard when you walk in. Stuff is constantly moving in and out. It's one of the joys of going there. One of the things I like so much is that, as, as the Brattle's owner told me years and years and years ago, it literally is something you could do every day and not see the same stuff. So I went back. I was right in the area right when they opened, so I went shopping for books. It is getting incrementally, but nevertheless, perceptibly warmer here in Boston. Uh, it, 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 when you're outside in the outside sale lots at the Brattle, if it's really cold, it's, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. <laughs> That's what you're thinking. And you don't want to bend over, and you especially don't want to squat down. Because you feel like you're just siphoning heat. The warmer it gets, the easier it gets to look at every single book. And uh, I needed to pick me up, so I looked at every single book. And I found a bunch of stuff, and I want to show them to you. <laughs> You know the drill by now. Mark Richardson and I are the are the only people in our little corner of BookTuber just on the road constantly doing book hauls for you. <laughs> but also for ourselves. It's so much fun to do. It is so much fun to do. Although I, he and I, we don't always get the same kinds of books, but we, have, we are at, on the exact same page when it comes to book hauls. He said it to me just the other day, and I couldn't agree more that as fun as they are the one thing that's missing is that we'd like to be doing book hauls together we'd like to be going out hunting for books together rather than being told by medical health professionals that you can't nevertheless it's still fun <laughs> so the first things that i got were murder mysteries uh, because we're in the middle of march mystery madness big booktube event that i'm one of the hosts for where we are just celebrating murder mysteries all month long uh, and that's fine by me. The Brattle had, uh, last year, got a huge collection of murder mysteries and have been cycling through them. A lot of those are making their way out to the bargain carts now. And I've been buying them steadily all along, as you know, if you've been watching this channel. Uh, and the thing I like about it is that the Brattle's prices are so reasonable that you can take all sorts of gambles. You can gamble with what you're, what you're looking at, which isn't so much of a boon for me when it's a history title or a biography or something like that because i'm almost certainly going to know about it but with mysteries it literally is a blind gamble and you don't want to pay a lot if you're doing that and i didn't and uh the first thing that i found is something i know i am going to love i know i am i've never read it nor ever i don't think even heard about it uh it's this one of these green spine penguin things it's called the mystery story uh, and it is not an anthology of murder mystery short stories. Instead, it's an anthology of writings about murder mysteries. The genre, the practice of it. Let's see what we have in the table of contents. Uh, uh, John Ball has an essay in here called Murder at Large. A lot of you will know him. He created the uh, the black detective, Virgil Tibbs. Who, if you don't, if you've never read any of those books, you'll you'll certainly know the immortal movie with Sidney Poitier and Rod Steiger in the heat of the night. Uh, but he, he has an essay in here, but there's the mystery story and cultural perspective, the mystery versus the novel, uh, an essay on, on amateur detectives by Otto Penzler. Uh, there's an essay on the private eye, an essay on women in detective fiction, uh, the ethic, the ethnic detective. That's also by John Ball, who really ought to know. It's the only thing is when you're reading something like this, this came out in the sixties, I believe. Uh, 1976. When you're reading something from 1976, you read an essay on the ethnic detective, you're going to have a whole bunch of examples that, that didn't exist yet. 
the police procedural, the locked room mystery, spies, gothic fiction, all sorts of stuff in here. All nonfiction, all just essays on the subject. I'm sorry this is in such deplorable shape because I'm never going to see another copy of this and I'm going to read this till it falls apart. I wish I could find, I probably wasn't made as a hardcover. Uh, but then the other two mass markets that I got are just ordinary murder mysteries, not uh, not an anthology of collection of stories about mysteries. The first one is a Tim Simpson mystery. Uh, it's by John Malcolm, and it's called Whistler in the Dark, an art world mystery, by the sound of it. Uh, buying paintings and other works of art from the prestigious art investment fund for at White's Bank is hardly the type of job that would get most men in trouble. But then Tim Simpson isn't most men, and trouble is what he's in, again. It starts out innocently enough. Simpson has decided to buy a Whistler painting, just the thing to give an extra touch of class to the fun's already stellar collection of 19th century art. A mysterious phone call tips him off to a previously unknown Whistler that he just may be able to purchase at a bargain price. And this is, this is fascinating to me because the only uh, real art world mysteries that I have ever read are the Lovejoy mysteries. And I thought they were really good, but they were mainly personality-driven. I don't know how much I learned about the art world from reading the Lovejoy Mysteries. I've never heard of this author, never heard of this book, so we'll see. Uh, and then this next one is by Sheila Radley, and this is an Inspector Quantrill mystery. A Talent for Destruction. A story of a peaceful English village and a shattering death. And of course, if you've been watching these videos, you know that's what sold me. I love murder mysteries. I love them more in 2020 and 2021 than I ever have in my life. But I have a special sweet tooth for English village murder mysteries. I, I don't know why, but I do. Uh, so what is this one here? I get the feeling that I'm coming in late to both of these, that there are previous adventures by both of these detectives, but that's all right. Two little boys were sledding in the Reverend's Meadow when they stumbled upon a human skeleton buried in the snow. Murder? Inspector Quantrell's investigation leads him through the quiet little village into more than a few pubs and to the rectory again and again. The Reverend and his wife have no answers to Quantrell's questions, and her senile old father doesn't even understand them. But as Quantrell gets closer to the truth, he unearths some facts about the Reverend's household that would shock the parish. I know one of those facts already, which is that the dead body was the organist. <laughs> but other than that, I'm, I'm clueless. Uh, then this next one is a callback to my previous Brattle Hall. In that previous Brattle Hall, I showed you uh, a book by Mary Johnston, a novel by Mary Johnston, illustrated by N.C. Wyatt, uh, that I went on a long ramble about how she was once an incredibly popular author in America and in England, that she was well-known. You walk into a bookstore and say, what's the latest Mary Johnston? The, all the clerks would know. They had to know in order to do their job. Totally forgotten now, never to be reprinted. And... Extra interesting, the, the one that we saw last time, because it was illustrated by N.C. Wyeth, which is no small thing. And at the time, when I was doing that, I said, I'm familiar with Mary Johnson's novels, but I think this is the only one illustrated by Wyeth. Turns out I was wrong. There is this one, Cease Firing. And it also is illustrated by N.C. Wyeth. And the illustrations are beautiful. Just beautiful. I mean, let me show you a couple of them. Uh, what have we got here? This, yeah, Sharpshooters. Perched in a tree. Look at that. This has uh, the bloody angle. This has tons and tons, lots of, again, uh, concentration on Stonewall Jackson, but lots and lots of, uh, lots more bloodshed than in the previous one. Look at that, a cannon mired in mud. Uh, can we do one more? Uh, are, are they all warfare paintings in here? They could very well be. Uh, what, I, think, I seem to remember there being one that was, yeah, violent, very violent, the bloody angle. Look at that. Totally accurate. And we have many first-hand accounts of the bloody angle, and men did fire at each other from point-blank range. They fired at each other from inside point-blank range. They slashed at each other with uh, with bayonets and with knives and sickles. When they were too close, you needed a little bit of room to reload a Civil War-era rifle or musket. And then when that was impossible, they did indeed club at each other and claw at each other with their naked hands. Uh, I haven't... <laughs> I've seen these. This is in perfect condition. It looks like the day it was made. I, I've seen these things and read bits and pieces of them uh, in an idle moment on the shelves of an old library a long time ago. But the idea to have them both, I, and, and I'm going to say now, I'm going to go out on a limb again and say I believe that N.C. Wyeth only illustrated these two books of hers. I don't know one way or another. Uh, but I'm glad to have them, very much so. Uh, and to revisit them, really visit them for the first time. Uh, this next one is a revisit. I have read it many times, and for some odd reason, I have the paperback on my library shelf. 
and it's 50 years old and it's falling apart. So I, I was happy to find the hardcover. This is Two Park Street by Paul Brooks uh, with illustrations by the author, including the one on the cover. This is a, a, an address that I could show you if you were to come here to Boston. Uh, and an, it's an address, a whole row of buildings, in fact, where I have been in every room, all the way to the attics, down into the basements and the sub-basements. I've been in every inch of Two Park Street. This is his memoir of the uh, 40 or 50 years that he spent with Houghton Mifflin. Uh, getting to know authors, this is all of the best anecdotes once upon a time. He used to go uh, out his front door, around the corner, and down to a shop called Goodspeeds, a bookshop called Goodspeeds. And once upon a time, for a long time, there were informal gatherings. Uh, our little Mount Olympus in the back room of Goodspeeds. He, used, he was a fixture there to just go around the corner and talk to book people. Uh, and most of the anecdotes in this little book are his most polished ones from there. He, he wrote mostly about nature uh, and whatnot. But this, I believe this publishing memoir is probably his biggest claim to fame if there is such a thing, because he's not remembered anymore, and this book is out of print and will never come back in print. But it's indispensable to me as a book memoir. I put this on the in the, on the same ranking as, for instance, Bennett Cerf's book, At Random, which I don't own a copy of, I'm amazed to see. I've had so many copies of that book, but I don't own a copy of it at the moment. It, the Brattle will provide. <laughs> it's a terrific publishing memoir, but so is this. So I'm very happy to see it. Uh, in a nice hardcover, somebody already put uh, a dust jacket or one of those plastic dust jackets on it. And it also has a ribbon bookmark from Houghton Mifflin. Uh, so, in every way, better than <laughs> the paperback copy that I have now, and very tempting to revisit, very tempting to reread. Uh, and this next one is a classic Brattle find. I have a whole shelf of these things by now. Uh, Lost Intellectual Luminaries of the Boston Area of uh, Charles Eliot Norton, James Russell Lowell, that, that sort of thing. Uh, so much... James Russell Loliana, in fact, that a number of you have emailed him over the years and said, you always complain that James Russell Lowell is forgotten and that there's no new big biography of him that sings his praises and cites his significance and captures him. Why don't you write it? <laughs> I've had so many people over the years, even long before Booktube, I've had so many people say, you go on and on in your cups when we're, when we're your helpless visitors about the literary pantheon that filled Boston between, let's say, the immediate post-Civil War era and the beginning of the Progressive Era. So 1865 to Theodore Roosevelt taking the Oval Office. The, you go on and on about how that pinnacle, that hub of the galaxy, pinnacle, was so great. And yet there are no books that say that. Why don't you write such a book? And I thought the closest I was coming to writing such a book as that was shepherding such a book as that into print, uh, Gods of Copley Square by Joseph, uh, by Douglas Shantucci. Great Boston historian, Douglas Shantucci. Uh, but <laughs> Douglas never wrote the book. He never finished it. And he has now died. So, <laughs> so maybe it is up to me to write a big biography of James, Ro of James Russell Lowell. Maybe that is the case or, or, Charles A. Norton or any of these people. But one way or another, here's another one of them. And the, you're only going to find these at the Brattle. This is Barrett Wendell and his letters. Uh, by an author that we have uh, that we have seen on this channel before. Uh, M.A. DeWolf Howe is someone we have seen on this channel before. And here we get, let me show you our subject, Barrett Wendell. Barrett Wendell was a literary figure of enormous renown, a biographer of Cotton Mather and William Shakespeare. Uh, and uh, worked at the Harvard Lampoon, as <laughs> was, was well known. The, the, this is his life and letters, and the, all of the Boston literary figures that I'm talking about are reflected in this book. It's just, a, just another thing to add. I have, like I said, I have a whole shelf of these things by now that are only going to turn up at the Brattle, and they're never going to get reprinted, and no one's ever going to remember these people. No one remembers who this person is. No one remembers who half the people are on that shelf that I could build. We saw a two-volume biography just the other day of another president of Harvard, another another denizen of Harvard. Uh, Barrett Wendell lived and breathed Harvard for his whole life, uh, but also had a, a vigorous Boston life. And it, it's it's the, when you read a book like this, the life and letters of Henry Lee Higginson or whoever, uh, you the life just comes right off the pages. It just beams at you that these people were alive and happy to be alive, that they were thrilled 
with the renaissance of learning and history and poetry and biography and letters, the Atlantic Monthly to Park Street, they were thrilled at this renaissance that was happening in the town they all loved. And it glows on the page and is forgotten. And I don't know why. I don't know why that is. Uh, Van White Brooks did his best to keep it alive with a series of books that was meant to dramatize that thing. But those books are also gone. So anyway, anyway, I was happy to find this. I will, of course, lovingly uh, revisit it. Uh, then this next one, I don't know if this will be a loving revisit. But the, when the Brattle Kismet, when the Brattle Gods put something in your path, best to say yes. Especially when the books are so cheap. Best to say yes and just see. You have to let yourself go. If you go to the battle and, and try to impose your own wishes on it, that will not work out well <laughs> at all. But if you go and see what the battle offers you, I hadn't even been thinking about this author, but there it is. Beautiful hardcover that already has a plastic dust jacket over the dust jacket. Why don't I? A perfect, this is a perfect example of that. Orion Shall Rise by Paul Anderson. A uh, story of, of his from, I think, the 90s about uh, the Earth recovering from a massive thermonuclear exchange. Those of you who are very young, you those of you who are 2020 kids to 2000, the 21st century kids, will just not have any idea what we used to live under. It was, it was the worry that, uh, that accompanied you all day and all night. It was the worry you went to bed with at night. It was the worry you woke up with in the morning, the worry of thermonuclear war between the United States and the Soviet Union, both of whom had bristlingly huge atomic weapons arsenals pointed at each other on a hair's breadth. So that a lot of us, when we saw a very bellicose Ronald Reagan get elected president, we thought that's the end of the world. This is why, that is why so many off-the-cuff op-ed writers said this is the end of the world. Not because he was going to get tough on the Iranians to release the hostages, but because people thought he's going to precipitate nuclear war. Uh, turns out we were wrong about that, myself included, as wrong as wrong gets. He not only didn't precipitate a thermonuclear war, but he worked harder than any other president ever to try and eliminate nuclear weapons from the entire world. One way or another, one has taken place. Actually, when did this book come out? Mark Richardson would probably know off the top of his head. Uh, 1983. This came out in 1983. So this is a Reagan-era book. Uh, and this is a story of a, a group of disparate group, some assemblage of disparate groups to try to recover civilization in the wake of that exchange. Well, the world has changed completely. Memories have changed completely. And this was right there. It was right there at the battle. It was dirt cheap. This Paul Anderson is an author that I, a science fiction author that I don't tend to like. He himself was a certified five jokers in the deck loon and also un, what i always refer to as unhelpfully prolific him and asimov and a whole bunch of other uh titans of the genre were unhelpfully prolific it'd be one thing if he had 20 books like this in his roster this or boat of a million years or something like that but he doesn't he has 20 books like this and then 200 other books <laughs> and, and that helps people who don't know anything about science fiction to trivialize it because these authors, in addition to writing good books, I seem to remember this being a really good book. It and A Boat of a Million Years and a couple of other things, probably the best things that I remember this author writing. I've read a huge amount of this author. I don't think I've read everything he's written, but I've read a huge amount of it. Uh, and I always, in my mind, have always criticized them for, you know, why did you do that? Now, I know why they did it. In Asimov's case, it's because he couldn't help himself, literally couldn't help himself. If he, if he wasn't typing for at least seven hours out of every day, then he was unbearable. Didn't, he couldn't, he couldn't bear to live. Not just unbearable to be around, but didn't like himself either. With him, it was a compulsion. With, with Paul Anderson and a bunch of other people, it was money. And I guess I can understand that. Of course, it would be the height of hypocrisy if I myself didn't understand that. But still, it means... It's, I, I guess... I guess I just worry that it helps to trivialize the genre in the minds of people who don't know anything about it. And I'm sure the aforementioned Mark Richardson would say, well, if they don't bother to learn anything about it, who cares what they think of it? And he would be right. <laughs> Nevertheless, I haven't read this in a long time, and there, the Brattle presented it to me. I don't think I have any other Paul Anderson here at all, of any kind. So bring it on. <laughs> Absolutely, bring it on. Same thing with... Uh, I view it as similar to, like, for instance, the other day at the Brattle, I found Artifact by Greg Benford. 
Another mid-range science fiction author who's been won every award, has been around, is a titan of the genre that I don't think is ever brilliant. One of my main problems with Paul Anderson is that he's never brilliant. And Asimov the same way. Industrious, but never brilliant. I could also say, for instance, Lee Brackett. Or, and a lot, there have been lots of people, there have been lots of names like that. It just bothers me, that's all. Fred Pohl. Where, where you, you want something like more than human, or man plus, every time, and you don't get it. And maybe that's not fair. I mean, one of the only titans left uh, of this stature who's still alive would be Robert Silverberg. Uh, and he wrote five or six books that are absolutely great and also wrote two or three hundred books that weren't. So maybe, maybe it's just too much to ask. But I would never have given Artifact by Greg Benford. Uh, excuse me. I would never have given that much of a second thought if the Brattle hadn't presented it to me. And the same thing is true with this, with Orion Shall Rise. I read this when it first came out. I doubt I'd have given it a second thought. But now that it's been presented to me, I will give it a second thought. I will give it a conscientious second read. Uh, then we have a book of Christian history. I absolutely love, <laughs> I absolutely love Christian history when it's done really good. And I know this author. I haven't read this book. I read this author's other book and really liked it. So I know I'm in for a treat here. This is The Origins of Christian Morality. The first two centuries. This author wrote a book about the first urban Christians. He's he's and that was terrific, which leads me to believe he's really good at the those murky earliest years of Christianity. And in this case, the the origin of what we might consider Christian morality. And I read a bit of this uh, already at the beginning that is just so wonderful. Uh, this book sketches the beginnings of that process by which there eventually emerged the whole intricate fabric of sensibilities, perceptions, beliefs, and practices that we call Christian morality. Superficially, it may be mistaken for another in the large genre, usually called New Testament ethics or early Christian ethics, but this book is not one of those for reasons to be explained in the first chapter. The reader will find here no answers to such piecemeal and historically naive questions as what do early Christians teach us about abortion, or what is the New Testament stand on homosexuality, or ought Christians to be pacifists? Nor do I attempt to discover the central principles on which a system of early Christian ethics is based. If there was such a system, it was enormously complex that, and defies reduction to basic rules or underlying principles. Rather, I have attempted in the following pages to lead the reader on a journey of exploration. The object of our quest is what Peter Brown has called, in a different context, the ecology of moral notions. The purpose of our journey is to attempt to construct the kind of ethnography of Christian beginnings. Fantastic. I don't know if that did it for you, but that certainly did it for me. That is the equivalent of a high school mash note. As far as I'm concerned, I'm wooing. <laughs> so that that is high on the list here. Uh, then we have... Uh, a little bit bittersweet. These last two are a little bit bittersweet uh, because the authors are no longer with us. In this case, the author just recently died. This is Cast of Characters. Uh, and it's about the early years of The New Yorker. And this author, uh, do we have a picture of Thomas Vinciguerra? Yes. He is terrific. He is just terrific. So you're going to get, I, I know this story mainly in the way that a whole generation of people knew this story, which is from Brendan Gill's book here at The New Yorker which I read and loved. It actually made its way into this room uh, because it's an absolute classic. Brendan Gill is such a good writer, totally forgotten, but such a good writer. Even I, I extol here at The New Yorker, even though I think it's an, a fundamentally unjust book, I think it's full of lies. It's full of Brendan Gill's own office place bile and bigotry codified into beautiful language and hilarious anecdotes. I mentioned before on this channel that I think the, the one of its worst injustices is to the novelist and short story writer John O'Hara, who Gill didn't like, and has vilified forever. The portrait of O'Hara in here at the New Yorker is utterly damning and not accurate, especially in terms of O'Hara's talent level, which is very high. It's as high as Fitzgerald. It's as high as Hemingway. We don't think of them that way, and I believe that's because of here at the New Yorker. So I already know the outline of a lot of these stories and a lot of these characters. Uh, and I also am a big fan of The New Yorker, just in general. I've, I've collected their comics, and I've read lots of, lots of profiles and whatnot. So much so, that you can see here on the cover, the cover mentions Walcott Gibbs, E.B. White, James Thurber, and the golden age of The New Yorker. You'll notice that's only three out of six people, and I can actually identify the other three people on this cover. 
uh, lots of New Yorker fans will be able to recognize this ape right here, but I recognize all of them, and that's when you know that you know a subject a little too well. But I don't think I've ever read this book. Uh, I Somehow I think it got by me. I think this is from fairly recently, and I, I think it just slipped by me completely. So I was happy to find it, a, a relatively new release, and one of two. The other relatively new release is a book that I have read. I got an advanced copy from the publisher. I got uh, the finished copy from the publisher. I reviewed it for the Christian Science Monitor, and I somehow got rid of it. I saw it today and was deeply embarrassed to realize, oh no, you got rid of that. No idea why. At an earlier uh, Brattle Hall, I showed you the hardcover of this right here. Uh, Nothing If Not Critical by Robert Hughes. I had a paperback and I replaced it with the hardcover. Well, I don't know if it's Brattle Karma or if the same person who sold that sold this, but I found the spectacle of skill today. Uh, the selected writings of Robert Hughes with an introduction by Adam Gopnik. Uh, and as is the case with so many authors that we see in these Brattle Halls, I'm always, I always note when I'm happy that the author lived long enough for me to review them. <laughs> I got out of the reviewing game. I was out of the reviewing game for a quarter of a century. So a lot of writers came and went. They flashed like meteors across the sky, and I never got my chance at them. And there's a handful, actually more than a handful of people where I did get my chance at them uh, before they died. Robert Hughes has now died. There will be no more books. And this is an anthology of uh, bits and pieces from his work. There are a couple of chapters from The Shock of the New, quite a few chapters from Nothing If Not Critical. There are three or four chapters from The Fatal Shore, his book on Australia, and a bunch of other stuff too, including uh, the chunks of an unpublished and unfinished uh, memoir. And I reviewed this for the Christian Science Monitor, and I will, if I remember, I will leave a link to that review down below. Uh, I have had, I had, a handful of long rambling one-on-one -on -one conversations with this author and really really liked him i was deeply deeply uh intimidated by him but i really really liked him and this book i loved for how many facets of his personality it gives you and uh adam gopnik's introduction is really good too adam gopnik and i do not always agree i, I have also reviewed him <laughs> but i want to read you the first paragraph of his introduction because it's worth it it's worth it it's just it's a, a thumbnail profile of Bob Hughes that he would have liked. And that's saying something because he was a taskmaster in all things. Uh, Robert Hughes could seem, when you first read him, and even more when you first met him, a man out of time, a baritone, even basso, in a world of tenors, a master of the rounded sentence in an era of fragmentary stammers. In largeness of voice and vision, he seemed out of joint with his miniaturized era. It was there in the way that his speaking voice and written voice seemed to flow together, in his love of heightened rhetoric and his hatred for the mawkishly confessional, in his habit of wit. With an aphorism offered not as an occasional effortful achievement, but within, within a stream of everyday talk, all in these ways, in all these ways, Hughes seemed a man more of the 1890s than of the measly self-conscious 1980s. You can imagine him bellowing at or with C.K. Chesterton or Hilaire Belloc, pounding a table with George Bernard Shaw and caricatured by Max Beerbohm more easily than being portrayed by Andy Warhol. There was nothing vaguely neo or post about Bob Hughes, though the art world he had, so, he had to sort through was all of those things. The distance between them was part of the point and the pleasure of his writing. Robert Hughes was many things, but he was never a meta thing. He was the real thing, living and breathing and red with exertion and sometimes rage. That's delightful. Like I said, I might have my issues with Gopnik, and he has not escaped me. <laughs> I will be around for every book that he writes, and I will review as many of them as I can. Uh, but Hughes is gone. We don't have him anymore, and I don't think we're going to get anything more. I don't think there's anything more to get. I think that was the reason for the inclusion of the memoir here, is that this is all that's left. I have my issues with this anthology, but I'm so happy to find it. So happy. It will come in this room. Uh, and that is it. That is another Brattle book haul. <laughs> I know I'm making quite a few of these, but I'm putting my money literally where my mouth is. I'm not kidding when I say that you could go to the Brattle every day and find something new if you wanted to. Every day you could. Uh, I don't know how often this week I'm going to go. <laughs> I, I do have other stuff to do. But this was a fine haul, and it's always fun to talk books with you. So we have The Spectacle of Skill, uh, the last collection of Robert Hughes, unless we get, as I suggested in my review, a big collected essays. That would be nice. <laughs> Very nice. But I don't I don't expect it. I'm not holding my breath. Uh, then Cast of Characters uh, by Thomas Vinciguerra. 
uh, his book about the New Yorker and the personalities that gave birth to it. Excuse me. Then we have The Origins of Christian Morality by Wayne Meeks. So much looking forward to that. So much. Probably more than any of the rest of these. Uh, then we have uh, Paul Anderson, Orion Shall Rise. Um, if the Brattle is willing to suggest it, I'm willing to give it a try. Absolutely. If I read it and have it and just don't like it at all, just think this is even worse than I thought, I'll ask Mark if maybe he wants it. He has a fantastic collection of hardcover books. Maybe he wants to give it a second try himself. And since it's in perfect condition already with a plastic dust jacket on it, if he doesn't want it, maybe his library does. Um, but one way or another, it's nice to have a number of safety nets for these things. It, because if it's not him, there's all of you. Uh, but I, I'm going to give it a try myself first to see. Maybe I want to keep it. Then we have uh, Barrett Wendell and his letters uh, by Isaac Wolf Hall. How? Just another Boston Life and Letters book of a type that I often find at the Brattle. And I'm very happy about that because it's a subject that genuinely interests me. And then we have Two Park Street by Paul Brooks, another Boston Letters book. Much shorter, but all about life at Houghton Mifflin. Uh, when Houghton Mifflin was four low-stooped old rooms in a, in a very old building right off Boston Common. Uh, then we have Cease Firing by Mary Johnston. Unbelievably, the second Mary Johnston novel illustrated by N.C. Wyeth that I have found at the Brattle in as many visits. I don't think that's going to keep happening, to put it mildly, I don't. Uh, then we have some murder mysteries. A Talent for Destruction by Sheila Radley. Being a village murder mystery set in a, in a village, in an English village. Then we have Whistler in the Dark by John Malcolm, an art world mystery. Uh, and finally, The Mystery Story, edited by John Ball, a collection of essays. That and the Christian morality book are the big draws uh, for this haul because I am deep into reading murder mysteries for March Mystery Madness. And I like reading about them even more than I like reading them. <laughs> so I'm going to dig into that. If I find plenty of stuff of interest, as I'm sure I will, Maybe I can work up a March Mystery Madness about some of the stuff in there, since I don't think this book is in print anymore. Uh, we shall see. One way or another, I've kept you too long, <laughs> so I'm going to sign off for now, but I will be back. Thank you, BookTube.